Welcome to Tangier. After 5,000 kilometres around Morocco, we feel qualified to tell you a thing or two about our travels and what you can expect if you come here. Hello and welcome back. I'm Kath. And I'm Stuart. And, and this, this is, is Nala. Nala. In December, we left South Wales on an epic road trip to Morocco. Join us as we attempt to take our home on wheels from mountains to deserts and everything else in between. Getting off the beaten track to show you the real Morocco. In this video, we're going to tell you the things that you need to know before you travel here, what to expect when you come here, and we're going to answer some of the questions you've submitted to us online in the last week. Come with us and have a look round Tangier. Do not come to this car park if you have a large motorhome. <laughs> incident in uh, Clip Tri, I've completely lost my nerve now for the yep. street dogs here. So we came out with the dog and we walked down the hill and decided that Tangier is not for dogs. So many cats, scooters, cars. The streets are so narrow here. We're gonna pop her back in the van for an hour and come out for a walk. That's the dog back in the van. I don't know who was more stressed, her or me. Everywhere we go now, the street dogs just looking at us funny. We've lost all confidence in them, sadly. See if we fare a little better, just the two of us. <laughs> Welcome to Morocco, where when you order a tea, this is what you get. So if you're planning a trip to Morocco, my first recommendation would be to join the Van Life Morocco Facebook group. It's a veritable mine of information. There are lots of featured posts that will answer all the questions that you have before you even get here. And when you're in the country, it's a really good place to get on the ground information. You want to know if there's a sandstorm in the desert? Ask in the group and then you know before you drive there. It really is a great resource and we highly recommend it. We're going to start this video with some general information and a list of questions that Jeff, the admin of Van Life Morocco, has sent to us, which are the most common questions asked in the group. First thing to bear in mind is you are coming to Africa. Uh, it might be a modern Africa, but it is still Africa. Uh, the way I look at driving is pretty much the way I look at everything else while I'm over here, is you forget everything Western society has taught you. Expect it to be different. Expect to be out of your comfort zone on a regular basis. And expect it to be noisy all the time. Noisy. It's noises, smells, animals, people, vehicles, everywhere you go. It is a minefield. But it's a great minefield. Now let's get on with some questions. The first question from Jeff is where is the best place to buy ferry tickets? So we only really know about coming from Spain across to North Africa. So you can get ferries from all over the world that come into Tangier and Tangier Port, but we're just going to focus on Spain to Morocco. So there are two major crossings. One is Tangier to Tarifa, and the other one is Tangier Med to Algeciras. The cheapest of the two is Tangier Med to Algeciras, or Algeciras to Tangier Med when you come here. So, and we would recommend getting your ferry tickets from Carlos. There are lots and lots of ticket sellers, but he's excellent. He's a mine of information. He's really, really knowledgeable, and he speaks really, really good English. He doesn't just sell tickets either. You can get uh, a few dirhams to bring with you, so you've got a bit of cash in your pocket, because after all, this is a cash economy. Uh, importantly for us, you can also leave drones with him. Uh, as... Uh, 
videographers, I love my drone. Uh, and throughout Spain and France, I used it quite regularly. But obviously coming over here, drones are illegal. The maximum sentence for bringing a drone here is 10 years in a Moroccan jail. I've seen a few Moroccan jails, only from the outside, <laughs> and I wouldn't want to be in them. So if you want to take a chance, take a chance. But our recommendation would be leave the drone at home or check it in with Carlos. It doesn't charge anything, and he gives you a receipt so you can pick it up on the way back. Next question is, what is the best deal on SIM cards? Now, we already mentioned Carlos, and you can also get a Moroc Telecom SIM from Carlos with a minimum amount of credit, which allows you to get into the country and get going. We would highly recommend you take him up on this. There are several Moroccan Telecom networks, but the two that we'd recommend is Moroc Telecom and Inwi. Moroc Telecom has limited data, you cannot buy unlimited, so it's approximately 10 dirham a gig, which is about 80p, and you can top up your Moroc Telecom card anywhere in Morocco that you see the Moroc Telecom sign. So it's really easy, the, it's the best network in the country, it works everywhere, there are a few dead spots, but we really, we've been everywhere and it really works very well. However, if you're looking for unlimited internet, then you want an Inwi SIM card and you want to specifically get the tourist unlimited SIM. So, and for this, you need to go into an official Inwi shop. It's 250 dirhams a month, which is about $25 or 25 euros. Um, and you get unlimited for the whole month. And then before the month is up, you need to go back into an Inwi shop and buy for the following month. It is that simple. It's completely unlimited. But it does have its limitations <laughs> in that in between towns and villages, it doesn't always work, which is why we kept the Moroc Telecom as a backup. And during busy times, Inwi is throttled. They throttle the service and it can be really, really slow, whereas Moroc Telecom is never throttled. We bought Moroc and Inwi because we work on the roads, but what you buy is going to depend on your needs. Next question, do I need a rabies jab? Now we're not doctors, so we're not going to give medical advice, but we'd strongly recommend you speak to your doctor about what jabs you do need to come here. Rabies is not the one of the ones that's recommended, although, as we found out, if you get bitten or scratched by any animal in Morocco, you should seek medical attention and get a free rabies jab while you're here. I was unlucky enough to be uh, scratched by a cat up in the Atlas Mountains, so I know only too well how easy it is to get a rabies jab while you're out here. It's a course of four jabs, two the first time, a week later you have your third, and then two weeks later you have your fourth. It's a free service, uh, all you need to do is find a Bureau of Communal de Hygiene. Have a look on Google, uh, they are listed in the main towns and cities. Failing that, pop into the pharmacy or go into a hospital. But you must get a rabies jab if you get scratched or bitten by an animal. It's not worth the risk. Rabies is endemic in Africa. In Morocco last year there were 12 deaths to rabies and the only reason it's so low is because the rabies jab scheme is so effective. The next question, and it only applies at certain times of the year, can you get a drink during Ramadan? <laughs> Lots of people think of Morocco as being a dry country, but for most of the year you can buy alcohol at the caves here that are attached to the supermarkets, mostly the Marjane and Carrefour supermarkets and some other small places as well. You need to provide your passport and show that you're not a Moroccan citizen to be able to buy alcohol. Um, during Ramadan, a lot of these close, even to tourists. So the way we understand it at the moment, because we're here during Ramadan, is the only cave we've seen that's open is one in Marrakesh and you have to provide your passport to get in there. You should know that alcohol is very, very expensive here. You're much better off buying it in Spain and bringing it with you. The other bonus is if you do bring it with you, you can use it as currency. Particularly uh, in the mountains and down towards the desert area, uh, we actually paid for one of our uh, overnights with uh, the bottle of wine that Carlos gave us for free uh, and a few cans of beer. Uh, and it wasn't the only time that we were asked for alcohol, but I don't drink. Kath drinks very rarely, so we didn't bring much with us. But when we come again, we'll stop the garage up because it'll probably work out cheaper. It's a very, very strong currency here. So particularly when you get to the Atlas and south of that and uh, the Berbers are particularly interested in whiskey, so that cheap Spanish stuff could take you a long way out here. 
other things that can be used as currency, old glasses, shoes, coats, warm clothing, anything like that that you can bring. You can trade for trinkets on the side of the road, particularly again once you get to the Atlas and south of that. Not a question, but keep small change and small notes with you. Every cash machine will give you a wedge of 200 dirham notes. We've just tried to pay for our tea, which is 40 dirhams, with a 200 note, and he's had to walk down the street to get change. I mean, we're in a big cafe restaurant, uh, and they still haven't got change. So wherever you go, keep your small notes. We are very much in a cash economy. You can have a pocket full of credit cards and debit cards, and for a lot of the time, they are complete and utterly pointless. We've moved to somewhere a little bit quieter now. With the chaos that is Tangier. So we're on to the next question. This one's from Facebook. Uh, Kath Malthouse. Can I ask what the whole trip cost? Uh, and did you work out there or is it just your normal jobs? So I budgeted for the trip before we came away. Uh, no, we didn't. We are not. We did not find jobs out here. I work on the road already. Stuart works when he's in the UK. So we save like mad for a chunk of cash, and then we've topped up our savings while we've been here out of my wages each month. So, and while we don't have an exact figure because we're not home yet, uh, we estimate that the entire three and a half months away has cost us less than five thousand pounds. So we will have a figure and if anybody wants to see the breakdown of our costs go to vannavigation.com where at the bottom of every blog we summarize our costs for those days and we'll continue to do so until we're up to date so but coming to Morocco has been cheaper than running a house in the UK. Before we came we did spend a bit of money getting the van ready uh, and buying uh, a few bits of rescue equipment so we have snow chains they are compulsory in certain parts of the Atlas Mountains at certain times of the year. So if you're coming over in the winter, do your own research to find out if you need them. But for the sake of 50 or 60 quid on Amazon, uh, you might as well just buy them. Uh, rescue boards, we have used them. Uh, they're just traction boards. Again, 50 or 60 quid on Amazon. You can buy them uh, readily. Uh, highly recommend bringing them. There's a lot of sand around. There's a lot of mud around. There's a lot of big holes around. Uh, we've built bridges, we've used rescue boards for that, we've used them to get us out of some sticky situations. Uh, the van itself, we did spend a fair amount of money before we came out here. We renewed the suspension because we knew the roads were going to be a little bit um, bumpy, should we say. Uh, and we also uh, spent money on uh, the brakes and tyres, the things that keep you in contact with the ground and the things that stop you. Brakes are important out here because the Moroccan driving standard is poor. They're quite skilled drivers because they don't seem to kill many people, but <laughs> how I have no idea. But the, the standard of driving is, yeah, absolutely ridiculous. Also, it's not recommended that you drive after dark in Morocco due to the reasons that Stuart just said <laughs> and also due to the fact that there's also many wild dogs and things in the road, lots of potholes and things. So it's not recommended you drive after dark, but we actually bought and fitted a light bar before we came. We've only had one emergency situation where we found ourselves driving in the night and we were very, very glad for the light bar. Very, very grateful for the light bar. And when I say uh, we replace the tyres, we run off-road tyres. Now, although they're not strictly essential, I would highly recommend off-road tyres because the road surface is pretty poor in places. I mean, if you're going to come here and stick to the tarmac, then it's not really an issue. But if you're going to go into the mountains or uh, on any of the pistes, you need that thick rubber, otherwise you're going to end up with a puncher. We actually brought two spare tyres, uh, and so far, touch wood, we haven't needed to use them, but the fact that we've got them, uh, yeah, a bit of peace of mind. If you come here and you stick to the A roads, so A roads here are toll roads, or you stick to the N roads, or a mixture of both, then the road surfaces are pretty smooth. Once you get off those roads onto the R roads or the P roads, you really don't know what you're getting. And while you may plan to come here and stick on the N roads, an N road being closed may just force you off onto R roads and P roads. Some of these P roads are nothing more than dirt pieces rocky dirt pieces 
that um, are basically just off-road driving so uh, yeah something to consider but lots of people come here and they just use the A roads and they use the N roads so the next question is from Instagram and it comes from Kraken Travellers. Thanks for this one. And it's, hi, did you find getting your van insured difficult? Is it fully comp or third party? We have been full time for four years and want to do our 90 days in Europe before going to Morocco for 90 days. Did you do anything different for your travels than you would normally do? Firstly, insurance. There are one or two uh, UK companies that will cover you fully comp in Morocco. Mine wasn't one of them. What most people tend to do is when you come in the port at Tangier Med, there are insurance offices there and you can go and uh, get third party insurance, which is a legal requirement. I think it was 95 euros for a month, 155 for two, and I think it was 210 for three months. We opted for two months, which is why we're uh, almost sat at the port now, because we're just about to run out of time. Yeah. Did we do anything different? Other than uh, the bits that I've already covered for preparing the van, no. Um, you should prepare mentally, that's what you should do. Um, I've never driven out here before and we have a large van. I, mean, I drive HGVs for a living so I'm quite confident driving big vehicles. But it has been a challenge. Uh, as Kath was saying, some of the, the roads are nothing more than dirt tracks. Uh, and some of the roads are beautifully tarmac But what you will find is when they're beautifully tarmac the Moroccans drive like absolute lunatics. In the middle of them. In the, yeah, you can have a dual carriageway and they will sit on that centre white line for no reason, absolutely no reason at all. Uh, you have to toot to, to get past them, which is another thing you should prepare yourself for when you come out here. The use of the horn, uh, they will toot at absolutely everything. Whether there's a need to or not, they will toot. You'll be able to hear in the background throughout this video lots of tooting because we're in a busy town. Yeah there's no need for it but they, they toot anyway and don't be surprised if sometimes you come round a blind bend and find a vehicle on the wrong side of the road they think nothing <laughs> here of overtaking even when something is coming on a blind bend or when you can't see driving down motorways you should also prepare yourself for animals and people uh, only uh, yesterday the day before we were on the toll road uh, and we came across uh, mum's walking little toddlers on the hard shoulder of a motorway, loose horse, chickens, chickens. <laughs> flocks of sheep, herds of goats. Uh, this is all on the hard shoulder of the motorway, no barriers. Men selling potatoes out of the sack. Yeah, people crossing the road with sacks of potatoes. This is something that you will not see in the UK. I said it once before in one of our videos and I'll say it again. To drive in Morocco is to forget everything Western society has taught you about driving. And that leads us on to our next Morocco tidbit, which is the police presence. So in the UK and in Europe, we're used to something we call policing by consent, in that we all behave ourselves and the police leave us alone. It is not like that out here. There is a very, very high police presence, especially on the roads. The first thing I noticed when we came into Morocco two months ago was every hundred yards, there's a police car. Some of them are just sat there looking at you, some of them have slow signs, some of them have stop signs. It's important to differentiate between slow and stop. If you don't stop at a stop sign, they will pull you over and they will fine you 150 400, or 400 dirham for not stopping at a police sign um there's the the fines out here vary so if you break the speed limit just by a little bit it's 150 dirham if you break the speed limit by a lot it's 400 dirham if you cross a solid white line in the middle of the road it is 400 dirham if you fail to stop at a police stop it is 400 dirham as well as police stops you'll also see the uh speed traps on the side of the road the actual machine now it's very tempting to think that because you're on a uk plate you don't need to worry and you can just drive through them but if they're manned and you won't know until you get to the police check what the, the uh, machine does is it sends the police officer a photo of your vehicle and the speed you were doing and you will be pulled over and fined on the spot there's no continuous you know you don't need to worry about points on your license or anything else you pull over you pay the fine you get a sheet of paper and you get to go 
on your way again. The police are very friendly, they're very jovial, they all carry guns, it's a little bit scary when you first get here, but they are really, really friendly and you really have nothing to worry about. They're here to keep you safe and uh, it's one of those where it's time to remember that you are in Africa. And we have experience of being pulled over. We've been pulled over four or five times, I yeah. suppose. The most recent, I was speeding, came off a roundabout, had my foot a little bit too far down. Got his little bit of paper. Got my certificate, <laughs> but uh, I was doing 70 kilometres an hour in a 60, and I paid the 150 after he showed me the evidence. If you get pulled for speeding by a police officer, ask to see the evidence uh, and ask for a receipt. Uh, there are times where uh, they will pull you over and you may not have been speeding. If they say, well, just give us a hundred, that's going in their pocket. Absolutely. That's your choice whether to pay. It's only about eight pounds. Sometimes it's easier just to let them have a hundred dirham and get on your way. We don't personally encourage that because it just encourages them to keep doing it. But if they offer you a reduction or you don't get a receipt, it's going in their pocket. If you have any doubts, tell them you have no cash and ask for the paperwork and tell them that you will go to a cash machine and pay at the local police station, which is perfectly acceptable. Easy way to find out if they're telling the truth or not. But whatever you do, be friendly in return because Always. they really are just doing their job. And keep your paperwork with you, your V5, your little white slip that they give you when you come into the country. Keep that with you at all times. Keep your driving license with you at all times. Make sure you have all this paperwork in the cab because a lot of the time they just pull you over, they ask where you're going, they ask to see your passport, they ask to see your paperwork and then they wave you on. We were going to um, Sydney Kauke, police pulled us over. We were like, shit, what have we done? We put the window down. I was like, you alright? He's like, hi, hi, where are you going? We said, Sydney Kauke. He said, OK, go. That was it. Didn't ask to see any paperwork. So please don't worry if you see the police. They're generally friendly here, but there are a lot of them. And they wear several different uniforms because you get local police, police nationale, and then the gendarme and the royal gendarme, which are all, all part of the Moroccan police force. Oh, and military police as yeah. well. <laughs> this next question is from Facebook, Tony Beach. Uh, hoping to do September and October to climb Mount Tubkal. Uh, what are the chances of a couple of overnights in the Sahara? Uh, would it be cheaper to independently arrange yourself with local guides or go on a package? So if you ever want to come to Morocco, whether it's in a van or just for a holiday, I would highly recommend you book in all the parts yourself. It's so much cheaper than a package holiday. So flights into Morocco, a return flight will cost you around £100. And then accommodation is pretty standard right across the country and costs about 40 about 35 to 40 pound a night that's often for two people and includes breakfast so if you want to come here it's much better to book all the parts yourself so i was talking to tony online and um he's coming here without accommodation and on a shoestring and he's planning to come with a tent and like i said to him the public transport system's really good here taxis are really cheap here hotels are really cheap here campsites are really cheap here and if if you're prepared to rough it a little bit there is really easy to do morocco on a shoestring just while we've been here we've seen we've traveled and kind of spoken to in the groups and things backpackers who are just traveling around the country by their own means on their own steam hired a car for a couple of days um taken trains uh and as long as you don't mind roughing it and you're prepared to navigate the systems it is 100 percent cheaper to book morocco on your own and if you do want to, to um climb to Cal, then the average price is around a thousand dirhams for a two-day hike so you are no longer allowed to climb Mount Tubkal on your own without a guide uh, to, due to a murder a few years ago and there are actually police checkpoints stopping you the walk isn't particularly technical they just don't want you up there without a guide which is understandable this next question is one just for calf so this one's from Facebook and it's from Brandon James Lark and he says, me and my girlfriend are coming to Morocco next winter after Europe. Can I ask how you keep busy and keep the ADHD under control when you don't have loads to do? Well, 
there is plenty to do here. So we're very outdoorsy people anyway. We like to keep an active schedule and that definitely helps with the whole ADHD thing. The one thing I have struggled here is the crowds and the noise can sometimes be a little overwhelming if you are neurodivergent. So um, it can be a lot sometimes. It feels like it's coming at you like this and that can be a little bit challenging. But honestly, I, I actually find that traveling and being on the road and the whole van life experience actually helps with my ADHD rather than hinders it. So uh, yeah, neurodivergent people, van life's where it's at. <laughs> so can you wild camp in Morocco? Over to you, Stu. In a word, yes, you can wild camp in Morocco. Uh, there are laws about wild camping, particularly on the coast or near military land, and you will get moved on. Uh, Park for Night and uh, Eye Overlander are very good tools. Uh, it's always worth having a look. Uh, that will give you uh, the most recent reviews to find out what's happened to people. We've been moved on by the police, uh, but only in a city. You will find that uh, when you are in the cities, that the police tend to work alongside the campsite owners, which is what happened to us in uh, Wesney, where uh, the campsite owner sent somebody out to uh, move us along. We refused because it was about half past 12 at night uh, and then she came along with the police and the police said that we could move on to a free parking in the city. What actually happened is we were led to her campsite. Um, needless to say we said thanks but no thanks and drove on which was the one time that we needed our, uh, our light bar. Campsites themselves are very very cheap out here. Uh, they range from about 50 to 200 dirham a night, the most expensive being on the coast. In fact, the most expensive we found is here in Tangier at 200 mad a night. Uh, the, the campsites themselves are mostly not European standards, so don't expect pristine clean toilets and showers, but they are functional and for the most part it's 70 or 80 mad a night, so six or seven quid. It's somewhere nice to camp, you can empty your toilet, you can fill up your water, uh, they're pretty good and they've all got facilities on site. You'll also find that uh, locals come round uh, in the morning with bread and donuts. Um, depending on where you are on the coast, they come round with fish uh, and things like that. So campsites are worth doing, but yes, you can wild camp, but you need to pick your spot. Guardian parking is everywhere. It only costs a few dirham to stay overnight uh, and invariably the Guardian stays there all night, which is nice for a little bit of security. Can you drink the water here in Morocco? Well, some people say you can, some people say you can't. We personally don't. So in big cities and things, the plumbing system is pretty good and the World Health Organization say that it meets the very basic standard for drinking water. For us, we just bought bottled water, it's a lot easier. Uh, it costs virtually nothing, it's like 10 dirhams for 10 litres of water. It's not expensive at all. Um, and you'll find that once you're away from good solid water sources, where people rely on wells and things, and when you're at the coast, that actually the water is very heavily mineralised. So putting it into your system can uh, bugger up your whole camper van system and your pumps and things. It also tastes a bit salty. I mean, you do what you want, but we bought the water. So what's the dress code for Morocco, Stu? <laughs> the dress code? Wear what you like. <laughs> well, it is for men. Slightly different for women. So there are lots of tourists here in Morocco and really you can just wear what you like, particularly when you're at the coast or on the campsite or in very secluded places. But just for me personally, when we're in town or in the Suk or in the Medina, where you're going to be very tightly packed with other people, people pressing up against you, etc., I personally feel more comfortable to cover up. So it's worth remembering that in Islam, um, elbows and things aren't really shown so the less you're wearing the more chance you're going to have of having problems so me personally when i'm in very busy crowded places i like to cover up here's what i'm wearing today in tangier it's also worth noting that the moroccans are quite tactile uh, particularly the men, they think nothing of touching you and as you walk around the streets you'll see them touching each other, holding onto each other's arms as they walk along. 
yeah, it's just quite bizarre. Uh, the first time uh, I really experienced it uh, was in Marrakesh, where a guy grabbed hold of my arm. Now, I come from a background where if somebody grabs my arm, I retaliate. I had to uh, pause and give myself a second just to realise where I am. So just be aware that uh, if they do touch you, they mean you no harm. It's just the way they are. On the plus side, if you're a woman, men won't touch you at all out here. So better just desserts, I think. <laughs> Which leads me to another issue. Everybody knows about women's rights and the stereotypes regarding women's rights in countries like Morocco. So I have not been disrespected or treated poorly in all the time I've been here. I have not been really stared at unless it's somebody looking at my hair and I've had no issues. But to come here is to forget everything you know about Western feminism. So where I've been respected here, it's in a respectful, revered kind of way where you kind of looked after and cherished and men stand out of the way, don't touch you, avert their eyes when they see you. Whereas Western feminism, empowers us and it allows us to do things and it gives us control so while it's different here it certainly is not disrespectful or at least it hasn't been in my experience and here's a little bit of information about the animals out here morocco is full of animals chickens cockerels cats dogs horses donkeys there's everything out here. Camels! Camels, yeah, I forgot about the camels. Brown squirrels! <laughs> it's estimated that Morocco has five million street dogs, and I don't think anybody even bothered to count the cats. Um, it's easy to come here and impress Western standards on this country, but it's also worth remembering that animals are used here in agriculture and as transport. So you will see donkeys working in the field, you will see donkeys as transport, you will see horses and carts as transport you will see people riding donkeys you will see dogs aplenty how in... are you oh hello you give me a fright then hello do you want to say hello vlog vlog yes, yes. for youtube yeah. so hello youtube ah, hello youtube <laughs> oh very good espanol uh... <laughs> may it's me what's your name uh, uh, brahim brahim kath kath <laughs> Stuart. Stuart. Okay. <laughs> Very nice to meet you, Brahim. <laughs> Welcome to Morocco. <laughs> <laughs> that was really cute. <laughs> Cat. Oh, YouTube? See? Fan navigation. Oh, I don't think you'll be able to. So if you come, I'll find it for you. <laughs> be right back. Well, as a new subscriber, start them young, eh? <laughs> anyway, as we were saying, there are a lot of animals here and donkeys and horses are used in work and for agriculture and for transport. And camels. And camels, yes. <laughs> camels also work here. Uh, dogs and cats litter the street. Puppies and kittens are everywhere. Everywhere. So many, many Moroccan children and adults but mostly children are killed every year by street dogs who pack and attack so it's uh, it's while it's easy to come here with western standards and want to scoop them all up and take them home it's worth remembering that they are actually wild dogs and um, as we learned in Kinitra the other day it's always best not to let your guard down too much. Most of the dogs here are friendly and we've had no issues with them but we've also seen dogs that are very thin and we've seen cats in some sorry states and like the rest of our advice sometimes it's best to leave your western standards at home and instead of coming here with judgment but come here with curious eyes and learn things about another culture and another country. It's always worth bringing some dry food with you as well. So if you want to feed the little puppies and kittens, you can do. They're always grateful for a handful of food. We would absolutely recommend bringing food with you. We've fed countless dogs. We've gone through 20 or 30 kilograms of kibble, <laughs> several bags of treats that our fussy dog refuses to eat at home, and uh, lots and lots of tins of meat as well. We fed dogs and puppies and everywhere we've gone. So if you want to help, it's a really good way to do it. There are also several 
several rescues here as well and you can always drop off supplies to them and you can even offer a few days work and help them out at the rescue so I know that they really appreciate that as well um, the Moroccan government isn't doesn't actually have a street dog program there are just so many of them here they do round them up and cull them occasionally um, uh, but the rescues here do really good work to trap vaccinate neuter and release and we think that work should be supported all the way throughout the country so final question from kyle martin on facebook and the question was where next who knows we'll have to see where the van points we're planning maybe a couple of short trips this year and then we have so many places on our list to visit we would love to explore more africa go through morocco to, to places like mauritania senegal and the gambia we also have our eye on places like the balkans and turkey but where next who knows keep watching to find out <laughs> And the one I suspect you all want to know is, have we enjoyed ourselves and would we come back to Morocco? In a heartbeat. For me, inland Morocco is where it's at. The coast can be quite challenging at times through a myriad of factors from the traffic to the beggars to the litter on the beaches. But inland Morocco, you really do see the real Morocco. The little villages, the, the little towns, just country life uh, and the scenery mind-blowing absolutely mind-blowing so yeah in a word would we come back yes and the kindness of the people here is wonderful although that doesn't mean you should let your guard down you should definitely keep your wits about you make sure you agree a price before you agree to anything and uh, be careful not to follow anybody down alleys in the cities <laughs> yeah.